bunny, good bunny. Oh, you're silent again. That could be me. That's me. Oh, there you are. Yeah, I can hear you. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. How are you doing? Very good. I'm heading off to Australia on Thursday. Are you feeling prepared? It's very simple. I'm just going to go and spend some time with my dad. So, Is the whole family going or just you? Uh, one, my elder daughter is in... Morning, Rob. Hi, Rob. Uh, uh, my elder daughter's in university, so she has to uh, stay for that, but my younger one is coming. Yeah, and my brother's going to be in Sydney, so we're all going to get together. Same thing, I think, is what you did when you went to Ireland recently. So that should be good. Um, but uh, no, it's been a good week. How was your week? Busy? Busy. So busy. <laughs> so busy. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I had don't to, know where the time goes. No, I was eating humble pie all week. Learning. I know. Yeah. Uh, so much of this stuff is new to me. Sorry. But uh, yeah, so I thought we could kind of uh, go over some of the stuff I encountered this week. And just uh, I'm very curious whether A, you've encountered it and B, what you think of it. So um Rob, this actually gets us very close to, I think, what Paul's been going on about for, for quite a while now. Not, not, not claiming that I understood it, but uh, we're actually getting... Uh, so w w which part? Uh, uh, the quantum mechanics and um, um, quantum mechanics based machine learning stuff. I know that sounds crazy, but uh, um, that's basically what this starts leaking into. Like you're in a machine learning thing and then you're learning about Feynman and Einstein and all these other people. So uh, it all goes back to entropy, I think, uh, which they all were hung up on. So very interesting. Oh, I'm just trying to get my ducks in a row here. Is this the one? Um, <coughs> have either of you seen <coughs> the Illustrated Transformer? Uh, it's a, a very famous article that attempts to explain I'll share it with you. So I found some great resources. Um, so there's this one, which is really good. Guys, I'm having trouble with my audio. I'll be back in a second. No problem. Uh, yeah. yeah that, so you that, go that, ahead, Rob. That was really interesting. Sorry? That, that paper you sent was really interesting. Yeah. Oh, I, I didn't send it. Rob, um, uh, Payam found it and I actually accidentally found the same paper through a different pathway. So uh, if, I, if I found the same paper from two different paths, then wow. Uh, did you see the, the results? They're just spectacular. Wow. Yeah. So, um, and that, that's actually pretty closely related to, uh, yeah, another problem I've been working on that just came up this week. Oh, okay. Um, it's actually very related to the other project I'm working on as well. Yeah. Um, so we need to get on top of this. <laughs> so, um, and, and I really like the fact that they had, <laughs> at least for me, um, kind of the conventional econometric models in there too. Yeah, yeah. I thought I thought that was great because it gives us a bridge, right? It gives us. There's another really good one here on attention oh, and uh, attention-based time series. So I'm just trying to feed you the good stuff I find. <laughs> and you saw that GAN, did you watch that GAN piece? Was... Uh, no, I got stuck with another. Video. No, that's fine. Uh, when you get a chance, it's really well done. It's it's quite old, but there's nothing wrong with it. And it, once again, we're back in exactly the same kind of space. And then the other one I encountered, um, have you ever encountered uh, this monster? Yeah, I've seen it, um, okay. but I can't recall what it says. Okay. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll cover this when Rose rejoins us, but I'll, I'll post this link as well. But um, I had to do lecture series and, and all this other stuff. So basically, uh, Payam in the email that he sent, which you received as well, I believe, um, has a link to the Stanford course on... Um, uh, attention 
uh, mechanisms. Okay. And they keep talking about uh, Langevin, uh, the Langevin system, and there's something called, um, uh, it's highly related to uh, something else. What's it called? It's not the born noise, that's another one. But anyway, yeah, there's two. There's two systems that are very similar, and they prove. I went that way, so <clears throat> the idea is is that there is um, an underlying um, kind of emergent trajectory of the system, and that's being occluded by Brownian noise. So you add Brownian noise to some underlying trajectory, um, and that's what this is trying to represent so there's an energy function which is this you know it's getting hotter it's getting colder or you know it's going up it's going down which is kind of the generalized thing and then there's brownian noise on top of that and this algorithm attempts to uh remove or identify the brownian motion um in order to approximate the underlying energy function so uh it's a noise once well, this gets back into diffusion. <laughs> so this is what the diffusion model is trying to do. So the diffusion model is trying to uh, remove the uh, the Brownian motion so that you can essentially get access to the underlying energy function. And then based on the amount of uh, variance in the Brownian noise, uh, you can bound the prediction under some distribution or something like that. But pretty interesting. So what have you been up to this week? Are you doing economic stuff or family stuff? Or a um, let me let me just pull this picture up and show it to you. Guys, I'm here and I'm listening. I'm just trying to fix it. My audio is really poor quality, but I am listening. Oh, okay, sure. Um. Take your time, Robert. No rush. Yeah, no, I'm just trying to pull the phone. Can you see this picture? I can indeed. Okay, so this is actually um, an interesting graph um, because what it's done is to generate group membership and behavior over time. Ooh. And this is statistic stuff. So they do it in kind of, uh, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm, I just got on, started learning about this stuff this morning. But um, what they're trying to do is, as near as I can figure, um, is kind of turn this around. So the idea is, I think if you fix the number of groups you're looking at, Mm -hmm. And you've got a bunch of historical data. This like looks like it goes from like zero to fifty mm -hmm. months. Um, so four years, yeah. And you can hypothesize that your data um, contains it's it's actually you view it as a mixture of three different data sets um but there's a classifier that's classifying each data point into one of the three different classes yeah that? well that that classifier is kind of crude because it looks at the entire sequence of data and then tries to generate a classifier that's not crude that's fine um, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so then what gets done? 
Go ahead, Rose. Sorry, I just wanted to ask, am I understanding that this is unsupervised? Uh, this is actually in the realm of statistics. So is this synthetic data or real world data? No, th this, okay, th this is real world data. Um, but let me just explain sort of the use of this. What, so what they're going to try and do is they're going to try and estimate these curves. And then once they have that, they're going to take some new data and try and figure out which curve they belong to and then use that to predict where they're going to wind up. Seems reasonable. What I'm asking with the supervised unsupervised is did did you did they start with the with the categories? The desister, the heavy, the low? That were I'm those not, Yeah, Rose, I'm, I'm not quite sure how they come up with that. I think what they do is they generate a likelihood function uh based on a predetermined number of groups and then see what that looks like so i mean they could have put in a fourth category here too or made it two and they'd get something you know i guess so it's it's clustering of some form right that we're yeah, saying yeah I, I, I don't, like i said I, i'm i'm you're not sure. Okay. There's a guy, I'm trying to go through his book right now <laughs> to figure out what it, exactly he's doing. Um, but getting back to uh, the stuff David was talking about. So suppose in your multivariate time series, you essentially have another dimension um, that's some form of state or uh, I don't know, you, you've got some combination of individuals and in you're, or yeah, some combination of individuals, you're trying to mod model them over time, but you kind of think that they're actually kind of two different groups in there. And somehow you want to treat them differently. So in the context of some of the economic stuff, um, I don't know, suppose you're looking at a bunch of securities and you've got stocks and you've got bonds and they're mm -hmm. going to tend to behave, you know, they got these common kind of characteristics over time, but it would be useful to classify them as a stock or a bond because you're going to have different risk profiles mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. So, um, so how many samples do we get? Do we get one sample? Or uh, basically the number of samples. So we have some unknown, unclassified. Um, so we have a person come in, uh, they've been here two weeks ago, and we find out that they've been, they're, they're on prescription opioids and they have, you know, decided that they don't want to keep taking it. So they've been underdosing to try and not uh, you know, get on that top curve, if you will. Um, so we have some conjectural data points that are being reported by the patient, and we're trying to fit them to one of the classes. Is that the problem that we're trying to solve? Um, yeah. I mean, so, so this this is, I guess, kind of how state of the art is it works in this area. Um, I'm, so, I'm just curious if that's the correct. Um, yeah. So uh, essentially, I think what they do is. You know, it, I think it's kind of like a k-means or something, but it's a little different because there's a time element to it. Mm. Um, and then once they've got sort of these groups identified, then they run a, a polynomial regression in time. Mm. So you got like months, month squared, cubed, and so forth. And they use those to come up with the shapes of these curves. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, so now they're going to get, you know, somebody new coming through the door and they're going to try and say, okay, he's closest to this curve. So we'll put him there. 
So you could solve this with multiple attention heads. So if you had if you have one attention head per class, let's say, uh, and um, you are uh, so if you look at the literature on uh, sequence to sequence and other things like that, essentially. Um, see if I can find what I Let's try to come up with a good. Okay, so we have the recorded data that we got from the patient, all right. Um, so let's say we record their dialogue of what they're saying, and we turn that into text, let's say. Okay. Uh, um, and we pass that into word to vec. And so what word to vec will do is it will look for synonyms and antonyms and so on, and it will essentially create an embedding for each word in their, um, in their text, okay? And so we, we code, encode that into some sort of an embedding, some sort of a representation of what we think that it is that they're saying that's uh, numerically represented. And we feed that, that's the X vector here. So we feed that into some weighted matrix that we've trained. So this is a trained thing. Um, so that, that's gonna be something similar to like a, a sentiment indicator. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we're trying to determine what kind of sentiment they have. Um, and then we feed that into um, the query, the key and uh, the value. We go through the attention mechanism and what comes out of that, yeah, well, uh, wait, it's a softmax. Uh, Sorry. So what's the difference between uh, WQ and WQ? Sure, good. excellent question. Uh, let me answer that. I'll just scroll up here. No, it's a very good question. I'll try and answer it as best I can by uh, is the picture. Sorry, I'm just looking for the right picture to explain that. Uh, where's the attention itself? So, sorry, this isn't very hey, easy. Hey, brothers, do you understand how, how this, this type of stuff works, kind of? Did you study attention mechanism? Yes, I did. If um, you can explain it better than me, please. I please. don't know. I don't know that I can. I'm like, it's several years since, you know, you get to the point where you're like, okay, there are libraries that do this. I don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't need to think about it too much. Um, yeah, this doesn't have the, 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 okay. So this isn't the latest one. I don't think this is not the one I was looking at because it doesn't have the little videos in it. Um, it had one video in it. Oh, that's him. Is it this one? Jeremy Howard has some stuff. Yeah, yeah he's still that really good. Describes this. Uh, I'm just trying to find the right picture. I'm not finding it. Yeah, sorry. I, you'll have to watch some videos, Rob. Sorry, I, I, I'm not going to try and explain attention mechanisms. Others have done a much better job, and I'll just make a hash right, of it. Yeah, so, well, let's so, just, just pick up. Yeah. Let's make it yeah. work. Um, so uh, back to where I was trying to get at. Um, so my point is, uh, and this is not, where is it? Sorry, let me see if I can find the correct one. Just give me one moment. I'll just stop sharing for just a sec. Carry on. I'm just going to hunt for the. Is it this one? Rob, in the paper that you were showing, uh -huh. um, that looked like there weren't a ton of dimensions just with the diagram. Is that <coughs> like, were they, were they just selecting time and some? I'm, I'm guessing you're, you're right on, on the number of dimensions. Um, the stuff I've been looking at is actually uh, criminal justice based. Um, 
uh, let me, uh, I don't know, so they might have half a dozen or a dozen variables. Um, I don't know, mother's education, father's education, mm -hmm. um, socioeconomic status, um, current environment, so stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, So I, I suspect in this case, um, it's going to be like uh, their age, their sex, uh, race, all of those have predictive power for opioid use. But, um, you know, do they have other kind of co-indicators of this, uh, like alcohol use, tobacco use. Um, I think it's, it's it tends to be stuff like that that I see. Do you mind putting that diagram up again? Oh, yeah. No, I, I just, uh, let me see if I can pull up the paper here. Um, it's just if I do it long, my, uh, my graphics card goes weird. I posted the paper in the link, so you should be able to open at least the, the preview in uh, If you have ac academic access, you should be able to open the plus paper. Yeah, I found the, uh, the, the that... link. Yeah. Uh, that's the previous one. It's the uh, journals plus one. The, the, the second last one. But I also posted a really good kind of uh, d uh, description of um, yeah, that's it. Uh, how sequence to sequence works with attention, and I would highly I learned a lot by going through this. It's very very good, and uh, I won't attempt to go through it because he's already done it, so I won't try and uh, go over it. But I went through that, and it really helped me gain a much deeper understanding of how multi-headed attention works. So that's very useful. Great, I'll look at it. Right. But you're going to bring up your paper, right? Uh, let me see if I can find it on archive. So, Rose, that really doesn't describe any of this stuff. It just uses it. I get, and to be honest, I get so frustrated with uh, sort of medical related papers. Yeah. Because <laughs> they, they, there's always like 20% of the stuff that you need to understand it that's always intentionally not presented. Yeah, it's kind of like something they'll say, well, OK, uh, we do simulations to to show this. And then they never describe how they do the simulations. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is that. I mean, the guys in the medical area are really dense about data. I mean, they don't seem to understand it for what it is. Um, you know, in this opioid area, I, I got so frustrated with it. I went back to looking at uh, some stuff in economics, and it's far more reasonable. <laughs> if you want to understand what's going on, yeah, it's just. <laughs> well, that's also your domain expertise, right? No, no, it has to do with how they view how they view data. Um, so they view. The, the medicine guys kind of just take it as something like, you know, this exogenous data feed that comes in and the, the, the econ guys say, okay, this is actually an endogenous process that's generated by people making choices. And let's try and understand a little bit of that. <laughs> When you say people making choices, are you talking about patients making choices or? Yeah. Um, so for instance, um, it was really the, the econ guys who were 
in, in this whole opioid area who are kind of getting towards thinking about where these drugs come from. Um, so I mean, one of the things that, that we're trying to do um, is essentially, uh, you know, have Bluetooth enabled uh, opioid medications. Okay, now this is where things start to get a little interesting because, okay, suppose you did that and suppose it really is effective. So, sorry, I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Is it Bluetooth enabled access to open a medication or something? Yeah. Or, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, so, you know, the idea here, uh, you know, you're, you're much more precise about who's using uh, the drug, um, you know, whether it's being siphoned out and diverted to some other purpose or and stuff like that. Um, but so here's something you got to pay attention to. Suppose that um, this is really successful. It's implemented. It's really successful. One of the things that that's going to do is that's going to change sort of the dynamics of how people use the drugs. And if you got a whole bunch of people who uh, are dependent upon opioids, they're already addicted, you're essentially kind of taking out some of that supply. <laughs> so what's going to be the follow on consequence of that? In terms of will they move to illegal sources? Is that what you're trying that's to certainly, Yeah, I mean, that, that's one possibility. Yeah, I mean, they could do that, could force them more into rehab. Um, but so that, that, that's where the economists kind of different. You know, they start looking at, you know, you do something and what's likely going to happen based on some sort of uh, rational, even a rational uh, addiction model. Mm -hmm. Oh. And the goal is, is to understand from the perspective of the dispenser, can we essentially identify behaviors from the Bluetooth data that would trigger um, us to believe that the situation has changed in some important way and we need to alert someone so that they can intervene? Is that the intention? Yeah, basically. Um, I mean, this, this opioid problem is, is is really primarily a U.S. problem. Mm -hmm. It's not nearly as true uh, overseas because we've got, or you know, non-U.S. We've got these really screwy um, mechanisms for opioids, and they're just you know kind of handed out. Well, it, it used to be like uh, Halloween where you could go and take as many pieces of candy as you want. And now they only, you know, give you a couple pieces. <laughs> but you can kind of go from house to house. <laughs> so there are, I mean, in the U.S., there are like 150 million opioid prescriptions issued each year. So that's like one for every two people. Lord. Yeah. Okay. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, yeah. Um, wow. You know, and if we look at uh, fentanyl, which is an opioid kind of derivative, um, synthetic one, um, I don't know, kind of depend on the estimates, somewhere between uh, 50 and 100,000 people die each year from fentanyl related huh? overdoses. Yeah, yeah. Where do you think they got? started doing that well it's probably prescription opioids oh okay so is the goal to prevent medical opioids getting into the wrong hands and that's as far as you go and then you hand it off to law enforcement or is the intention to try and uh, uh, do behavior modification uh, on existing uh, addicts who need to uh, essentially get off the uh, 
or both? I, I don't know. I mean, what you, I, I'm trying to understand the goal here. I, are you trying to be the good citizen and let law enforcement know that something is going wrong? Or are you trying to improve the situation for the patient? Don't uh, I mean, uh, yeah, kind of our focus is more the, the, the patient based. Um, okay. So, yeah, I mean, for example, suppose we take those, uh, you know, those longitudinal curves as given. Um, if you could look at where, you know, which curve someone is likely to be on, then that's important information. Now, the, the part of the problem, though, you know, we got those different curves and their different use patterns. We don't really know whether the person's actually using them or not, or whether they're getting them and reselling them. Understood. Okay. Um, Rose, what's your comment on this? Is this something that you have oh my God, to face it's in a your complicated life? problem? I guess I'm like, if you're using predictors like age and gender and socioeconomic status what are you thinking is going to happen then that you will not give opioids to some people who would fall into a particular category um i, I, I think you're going to be a drug addict so i'm not going to give you this pain medication like it feels to me like that's way too it's too late in the process Is it inherently unfair. You're poor, so you can't get pain medication. Um, I, I don't. I don't think it's too late in the process. Um, but my take on this is actually a little different in that. So I've been digging digging into what information we have on sort of drug opioid abuse statistics. And it seems to me that the way you'd really make a difference um, is if you can figure out how to start constricting the supply that's issued. So what that's going to do is that's really not going to do much for anyone who's kind of already on it and perhaps addicted. Mm -hmm. uh, what it could do is sort of start that process of scaling back. Um, the estimates I've seen suggest that about 70% of opioid usage is coming from kind of legitimate sources, you know, other people's prescriptions, uh, stuff like that. So when we saw that red line at the top, I mean, one would think that, gee, those guys are the heavy users. Um, well, perhaps not. Perhaps they're just the heavy sellers. So if you can figure out ways of trying to monitor much better, um, are they using the drug as prescribed? So we should be able to get, you know, like some sort of biometric information that would tell us, you know, when they're taking it and what the um, reaction is. But the goal, generally speaking, is to have an independent party regulate the behavior of the person because they don't have enough self-control to manage the situation themselves. And they don't. I'm not saying they do. I'm just trying to clarify Rose's question where there's this question of agency, right? Are we taking away agency from people who already have a deficiency in agency or... Um, are we trying to prevent people who don't have the addiction from becoming addicted? Um, what's, what's the end game here? Is it to prevent or to uh, remediate or? 
Uh, you, you mentioned the term take out the supply, to regulate the supply. I, I think that's valid. <clears throat> um, but uh, the question is, is that if we're going to regulate the supply, by what bias do we restrict? Do we just restrict everyone? Do we just restrict randomly? What, what, do we restrict by age, by gender, by socioeconomic status, by... Well, uh, need. So in our case, the uh, these devices, I don't know, they might cost a couple hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so you could say give them to everybody. Um, that's going to wind up being expensive. I see. Uh, you, but if you could turn around and say, okay, so when, when we're looking at this data, there are really two components of it. There's sort of the individual use of it. And then there's the divergence of what they have to others. So let's explain the-, the Okay, the so suppose I've got a, uh, I don't know, like just my shoulder surgery. So I've got a, uh, a prescription for 28 of these pills. To okay. try and restrict opioid prescriptions. Well, okay, yeah, so, yeah. So, so the, the, the problem is outside of the normal system, right? There are people who are out there who have made a business prescribing these medications. True. Yeah, it's not that they're accidentally doing it. They are willfully doing it. So are these people going to go out and say, oh, well, I'm going <laughs> to give this Bluetooth? Like they're not because it's part of their business. Like I would say m most physicians at this point in time who are working within hospital settings or whatever, like the, there, there are so many procedural steps in place to try and restrict prescription of opioids. Uh -huh. There are now, yep. Yeah. And we still have problems. And now I'm not saying it never happens that people get them, but for the most part, there are gonna be restrictions saying, well, you only get them in these circumstances for this amount of time. And if something other than that is happening, there are internal processes to, to escalate that within the medical system. Already. Yeah, yeah, Already. that kind of makes sense, Rose. Um, so what, what we've seen in the US data um, is that there's been, I don't know, at least you know, over the last probably seven years or something, a decrease in the number of prescriptions generated by about a third. So, um, so that takes us down to the 150 million. Mm -hmm. It takes you down to the 150 million. Yeah, so you know, it used to be 250 something, approximately. Okay, little, little segue here. So part of what's going on, this is my perspective, um, is that in, um, uh, we had a change in health insurance policy uh, about 2010. Um, and one of the, this is the Obamacare Affordable Air Care Act in the US. Um, so one of the things that it did was that it said, okay, if you're a hospital, if you're a healthcare provider, we're gonna base how much we, the government, pay you for taking care of people on how good a job you do. Okay, yeah, seems pretty reasonable. Now, part of that how good a job you do comes down to what individual patients say about their experience with the physician or with the hospital. And what people figured out pretty quickly is that the way to, or one of the ways to get a good outcome on those patient surveys is to essentially provide people with prescriptions. Uh, take this, it'll help solve your problem. So we created incentives for people to write lots of these prescriptions. 
And it's not just uh, it's not just opioids. I mean, there are other types of drugs, uh, you know, antidepressants and stuff like that. Uh, uh, attention, um, like Rivlin or something like that. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. We saw the same pattern with those guys too. Right. And that, uh, that's, yeah, that's also, yeah. Ritalin was prescribed to everybody for a while there, but yes. Yeah. So, um, so there's an inductive bias that's being brought in by the policy, an unintended uh, consequence, and we're trying to prove that the policy itself is at fault and we need to update the policy. Is that the. Well, um, I think that's part of it. Um, so, you know, my conjecture from looking at the data a little bit um, is that, yeah, so again, you know, kind of look based on some of these studies too. So about 70% of the pills wind up getting diverted. Wow. So in my case, uh, yeah, I've got 28. So on average, uh, you know, 20 of them would wind up uh, flowing back into other people using them. Either that, or there's one other explanation too, and that is maybe uh, there's sort of a, a systematic um, theft or production of these uh, that's somehow making it out into the market. <clears throat> so I hear you. So, yeah. so, so suppose a manufacturer says, okay, I'm going to make, uh, you know, 50 million of these, but in fact, they actually make 70 million of them. Mm. 20, 20 million of them, just, you know, kind of like a gray market problem in China. More generic problem, yeah. But then that wouldn't be appearing in the prescriptions, in the 150 million prescriptions. Right. But if we're trying to infer how many of them wind up being used from other people, from other sources, and there's an, an additional, you know, source of that, that's going to narf up all the estimates we got. So. You know, it, I mean, I think that's the that's part of the problem, right? Is that I think there are there are procedural steps in place to try and limit the number of prescriptions that are out there yep. to monitor when prescriptions are being misused, right? Either either the person isn't taking them themselves or they are they're taking them themselves, but they should no longer be taking them themselves. Um, I would agree on the first. Part, but not so much the second. Which which piece? I mean, no, no, nobody's monitoring me. <laughs> no one's called and said, you know, really, you know, how's how's your how's your medication going? Um, stuff like that. But how long have you been? How long have you been taking anything? Uh, I mean, I. I took them right out of the, the uh, right after I got out of surgery because I was encouraged to do so. Um, mm -hmm. Since then, I haven't. But they haven't filled another prescription for you. No, and it's it's non-refillable too. Right. But I mean, so so how much of a problem is that, right? So you've had surgery, you had a valid reason to take it. Like, are mm -hmm. you going to go onto the black market and sell your 20 pills? Like, <laughs> Um, no, I mean, search costs would be too high. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you if, tried if, to refill that prescription, I guarantee you there would be some escalation. If you tried to refill that prescription twice, somebody would be like, okay, there's something weird going on here. I would hope so. Um, I haven't seen evidence. Would of... that be the healthcare provider or the... Y yes. Like, I I mean, I can't speak for all health systems, but I would say that, I mean, I definitely see these reports coming out, like for for opioid use, right? And if people are requesting prescriptions, that would all, each 
you know, physicians, heads of physicians, they get reports on a weekly, monthly basis showing who's prescribing, are there multiple prescriptions, and they go back to them and say, like, what is your justification for giving this, this particular patient additional, this is outside of procedural guidelines. I mean, I can't say that happens everywhere, but I think that there are procedural things in place in most big healthcare systems. Um, yeah, I mean, th th this whole area, I think is evolving relatively quickly. So it's possible those are, uh, those are in place and they're really kind of starting to have some enforcement teeth. Yeah. Um, so let, let me tell you one example. So there was a guy who was uh, oh, a joint replacement specialist um, here in Indiana. And he was notable because uh, he was pretty good, but also he prescribed more opioids than I think anybody else in the state. Mm -hmm. And the university came back to him and said, hey, gee, you know, uh, you know, this isn't good. And, and he kind of shrugged his shoulder and said, well, my outcomes are good. My patients like me, like me. What are you going to do? And they kind of walked away. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree that we have a problem where we're treating patients like customers and customer yep. satisfaction, especially when there are business interests trying to manipulate customers to request particular treatments, right? There, there's, a, there's definitely a problem with that. And a lot of drug manufacturers specifically infiltrate user support groups, et cetera, to try and encourage, oh, you need this, and doctors are trying to keep this away from you. Oh, that's clever. Right? But, but I mean, it's, it's really sad. And that's a side effect of decentralized government, right? I mean, the, the alternative would be to have China, which I don't think you want either. So uh, isn't that just an un unintended consequence of a liberal democracy where You've decentralized power, you don't have a strong government, they don't have the ability to enforce behavioral modification on individuals. So, so here's a question you might know the answer to, Rose. Um, so, like, you know, these ads I see on television, you know, that make me want to think, gee, I got this problem and therefore <laughs> I can ask for this drug. Yeah. Um, how long have those been going on? Is that comparatively recent? I mean, I don't, I don't watch a lot of television, actually. I don't know the dates either, but when you look at prescription drug, like if you pull up any of the studies that talk about polypharmacy and you look at those, those graphs, they're exponential over like, say, in the last 10 years, 15 years. So by, by that, you mean like the number of drugs people are taking is yes. exploding? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Like, I, I think we've talked about this before, like these, these high complexity patients, like when you look at their medical charts, and this is even in like public data sets, like I know that I've looked at this on the, in the NHANES data set, which is a publicly available data set. And it, you regularly see people who are taking 20, 30, 40 medications. And these are not people like with oncology treatment protocols or anything. These are just people with chronic illnesses. And there are particular medications that you see every single one of these patients taking. And is it working? Are these people feeling great? Like, <laughs> no, they're getting more and more sick. Is there a... Is there a good study that kind of documents that trend? Um, I can, I, there, I mean, there are so many people who, like if you search for polypharmacy, um, study, I mean, the, I, I like the NHANES data set because it's randomized, it's over a period of years, it's very well, it's very well run and prepared. 
And so you can, you can see even on that, like who's taking what and what are the trends over time. And so if you want the data set, that's a, a link to that. Pardon me? Could you, could you post a link to that? Data yeah. Set? But wouldn't, if we did come up with some strategy, wouldn't that be essentially um, cited as kind of what the drug companies don't want? And so they would use their power to disrupt or discredit or essentially yeah. suppress that outcome? Yeah, that's totally what they do. Mm, yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. yeah, that's totally what they do. I mean, they're, they, they don't want to be threatened by people saying that their, their medications aren't good, right? They come after people pretty hard is my understanding. And, and the other piece of it is you're not going to get the drug companies to change their behaviors, right? Like your best shot is trying to get people to recognize like this is not what's really good for you. But people don't care. People want an easy solution. Yeah, so, so David, on the, on the other side, um, somebody's paying for this. And no, no, I, I'm, I'm not, I was it, just curious. I mean, if it's all. not working, they've got an incentive to say, well, gee, you know, this person's taken 30 medications. This obviously is not helping them. Maybe we can decrease, you know, some of the more expensive ones and, uh, you know, not get any worse outcomes and maybe better. So, um, so the, age, the, the health authorities would step in and say, this is not an effective use of our capital we're not going to support this kind of activity anymore. That might work. It's it's so much more complicated, guys. Like <laughs> the feedback loops that happen from within. And so I think where we are right now is you see these procedural things in place that actually drive additional diagnoses and treatments for patients because the belief is there, well, if we identify this issue and treat it, people are going to get better. But I, I think there's just a lack of acceptance that that's just not true. <laughs> Identifying additional, additional diagnoses for the most part, I mean, I'm not saying that there are no diagnoses that it's useful, but identifying, putting names on a lot of these chronic diseases and associating the diagnosis with the patient. And then of course the treatment that comes along with that. When I look at the data, it's like people are getting more sick, not less sick. And so the, even like the, the, the government bodies that are involved in this right now, a lot of it is process oriented, like, oh, let's identify the people who are diabetic. Let's identify the people who have chronic heart failure or whatever. And then once they're identified, their treatment treatments put in place. For some of those things, maybe, maybe those things help. But I would say in general, it comes to the point where this central group of pa patients have every diagnosis possible, every treatment possible, and they're still sick. So as a data scientist, stepping back from, you know, medicine, um, what's the problem you try? Well, what is the problem you're trying to solve and how would you solve it? I mean, I think that's evolving. I think when I first got involved with this, I thought there was a different problem that <laughs> I was trying to solve. Now I'm just sort of like really just observing and trying to understand the feedback loops and the, and the role that that's playing, right? Like you, you almost need to understand a problem before you can even go about trying to solve it. And that's the mode I'm in right now is like, just observe data collection. It's like giving up the idea you're going to solve this problem. And I, I don't know that data science is, is ever going to solve this problem, but at least gaining an understanding of what, what the problems, and it, there are more than one problem, but what the problems are. 
and how we're making things worse as we try to make things better. Well, let me uh, let me apologize for kind of hijacking the discussion here. No, not at all. No, it's highly relevant um, because you know how do I put this? Um, I think data science does have to step up to the plate at some point and start um, having a role in policy, and this might be a good. Um, first step, because if we can prove something in data science that really makes this very obvious and clear, then I think that's a step in the right direction. So in terms of activism, I think having clear and unambiguous uh, data science on our side is a very useful first step uh, in establishing uh, the need for a policy change. Uh, it's very hard for non-academics to argue against statistical arguments, or at least that's my opinion. Um, so I don't think it's a waste of time at all. There you go. So that's my kind of first. Oh, I don't think it's, clearly I don't think it's a waste of time, right? But I just think it's so much more complicated and medical data sets are so much more complicated than we, well, certainly than I ever realized. Right. Um, sure. I think a lot of it comes back to that McGilchrist idea that we we almost create our reality, right? Like we 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 sort of have these beliefs, and then we we basically solidify the beliefs by the actions that we take. Yes, yes. And then it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. And I think there's an awful lot of that happening in in medicine and in machine learning right and trying to trying to unravel that is not is not easy it's not that there are no facts in there or that all the facts are wrong right, right. but sometimes when we apply something that was used in one situation and apply it more broadly believing that it's going to be true in every situation we end we up over generalize yeah we overfit on yeah. insufficient data and end up yeah. in all sorts of problems I, I completely agree but once again the um the uh, literacy in understanding this stuff i think is also horribly lacking and if we can improve the literacy then that must have a benefit beneficial effect in my opinion mm -hmm. So um, I'm certainly not suggesting we give up or anything. That's not what I'm saying at all. But um, having a defensible, rigorous data science based argument to say that the policies aren't working is a very useful first step. It won't get us to the finish line, but it's certainly valuable to to establish a precedent, if that makes, would you agree, Rob? Do you think that there's benefit in, yeah, in, yeah. in a strong statistical argument against the current behavior? Or? You know, the, to me, part of the appeal of the data science um, is it, it's kind of data agnostic. And, and by that, I mean, you don't necessarily buy into a particular framework of looking at things or figuring out which things you're going to look at. You're just sort of more, let's look at the information we have and try and utilize it. So, I mean, this is one of the frustrations I have with sort of some of the medical folks that, uh, you know, they, they've got their checklists, they've got their processes in place, like you said, and, and it's sometimes tough to get them to step outside of that. I think there is an advantage um, from uh, kind of the econometrics focus on data because a couple of things it pays attention to are incentives of people and how that shows up in the data you actually have and in things like uh, sample construction. So, um, if you only have p 
patients show up in a data who meet a single or meet some set of criteria, then that's you're actually censoring the data in an important way. Mm-hmm. And you got to be careful about drawing inferences sort of outside that range. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you, which is why that data set I just sent you is nice because it is random. They just go out and they select 5,000 people each year and it's been going on for ages. It's a very well put together randomized data set. Um, So they they got a bunch of variables and- They have a ton of variables. They do labs. They ask questions about how the patient was feeling. They they take medic, like they list the medications. They like show me the bottle of medication. Like they, it's really very well done. Nice. So is, is this kind of generally available or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody can use it. Interesting. I had never heard of this. Yeah, no, it's great. I've done, I did a bunch of my stuff on it. It's really well done. And even if you're just trying to get a sense for things like, like the polypharmacy issue, right? To be able to see that for yourself over time. Like if I look at particular, if I look at women in a particular age group, what is what is medication use utilization look like over the last 10 years? It's really easy to do that sort of stuff very quickly. Whereas when you look at the EHR data sets that are out there, where it's not randomized Uh and the procedures that are in place are doing all kinds of selection bias before you even begin. Like, I think we all believe that once we got our hands on EHR data, we were going to be able to apply data science to it and learn a lot. And I, my opinion is that we're we're not, we're going to learn a lot about the practices in the particular medical system we we'll learn a lot about the past, but not much about the future. I think. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I really question how much we learn about patients as opposed to how much we learn about how a particular group of physicians go yeah. about doing something. Yeah. We learn about the standard processes that are in place. So quick question on this data, Rose. So this is a different group of 5,000 each year? Yeah. Roughly? Okay. So not the same people. Over no. Time. Okay. No, but but it's random. Yeah, okay. Just just making sure I understand. Yeah, re- you can read about it. They have a lot of great information in there and like they they it, it's worth taking a look at. It's it's a very well put together data set. So Rose, in your opinion, what is the goal then? Sorry, I I, huh. I, I don't think Rob's Rob's situ- uh, position is 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 bad at all. I'm just trying, and, and your comments are valid too. I think you're you're expressing extreme frustration with the system, which probably is very very valid. But what should we be doing, in your opinion? Like, what is the right thing to be doing? You know what? I don't know that I can answer that for everybody. I can know that that for me, right? I came into this whole data science side of things thinking like oh, this is going to be great. We can apply data science techniques to these data sets and and come up with new insights. And what I'm finding is that you really need to understand what the data mean before you can do anything. And that's where I'm spending my effort right now is like within a medical system, really trying to understand, gaining knowledge of the data set and then how the data set is influenced by procedural things that are, are put in place, right? It, and, and the best you can hope for is that you get a really good understanding of a single non-randomized data set. And you might have some ability to say, oh, well, even though the data science is showing this, I think there is this particular selection bias in this case. So, it, 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 David, have you seen attempts to sort of incorporate the selection bias in some of the machine learning? Uh, I've heard uh, some of the highest ranking people in machine learning say it's machine learning's biggest problem. <laughs> so, um, Elias Barenbaum kind of, that paper that he has, he sort of, he, he starts to touch on it, right? Like, 
where, where the selection bias is identified and then you sort of constrain what you can infer because of that. But I, I think it's still, it's still in the early stages of it. Well, but there are a lot of econometric approaches to dealing with this. So it would seem in theory, you could kind of overlap that into uh, you know, a machine learning approach. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, the selection bias in machine people. learning is that people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and spend years and years of their life to learn how deep learning and machine learning works. And then if they get a negative result that proves that machine learning actually isn't at all useful in this situation, they essentially just, you know, push that off the side of their desk and keep on trucking so that they can keep generating more positive examples of how much machine learning is so wonderful. And we're already off the rails and that no, there's no, like, pushback on all of this crazy shit we see in the news about machine learning. There's no pragmatist saying, uh, no, that's not the way it works at all. And if there are such people like Gary Marcus, then they get shut down almost instantly. Mm -hmm. So machine learning has its own bugbears of this, of this sort. Well, are, are you guys familiar with Tobit models? You, you've shown them to me. I, I, I can't recall them. Just with the Guys, right. I'm so sorry. I really have to go because I have something right. else that I need to go do and I'm running late. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, now we're over. Sorry, guys. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Great conversation. No, all good, Rob. And let's keep let's keep going on this because I think this is actually very useful. All right, Rose. Yeah, we'll yeah, talk to you next week. Okay, see you, Rose. Bye. Um, so David, you want to get back to a, uh, a schedule? With you? Absolutely. Yeah. I was hoping that, well, I'm flying in on Thursday. Okay. So, um, yeah, so Maybe when just start, we... start in a week or something? What's that? Start in a week, two weeks or something? Uh, well, I will be in Australia um, for three weeks uh, and then I'll be back. I right. do so want to keep this one going. 14 hours difference. Uh, so the time, yeah. Uh, I basically, I think for me, uh, it's going to be tough. Like it'll be at the end of day, your time, at the early beginning of my day, my time. And I'm not sure if meetings late in the day for you are convenient or useful because I tend to fade out pretty early. I'm, I'm done by. Yeah, but you're up early. But I'm up early. Yeah, I'm, I'm the reverse. Oh, you're late. You're a night. night it, it takes me a hard time to get going in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, right, the time in Australia right now, for example, I don't have my phone with me. What is the time in Australia? Um. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, so it's 4 30 a.m then now so if i did a 7 a.m which i'm happy to do that would be in two and a half hours from now which would be what's two and a half hours from now your time it'd be four o'clock eastern is that convenient on a saturday uh -huh. Um, yeah, sure. Doesn't or, have to be. I mean, if you're going to dinner or something, uh, I mean, I'm not trying yeah. to. Um, well, I mean, how, how long are you going to be down there? About a month or so? Three weeks, as I say. So I fly out on Thursday and I'm back three weeks after that. All right. Well, l l let's do this. Um, I mean, you're going to be busy doing a bunch of stuff if you got time. Actually, I've spent the, uh, just to be clear, I'm spending most of my time learning about time series. Like, uh, it's oh, okay. just, I have nothing to report because I'm just reading books, which isn't very interesting. So, um, but uh, I'm, okay, I'm so trying just, to catch up with the state yeah, of the so art. Just let me know when, uh, when a good time is. And uh... Okay, so if I text you, like if I wake up super early one morning, um, and it's convenient. I might give you a text and say, if you have some time, I'm, I'm taking my laptop with me. It is fully capable. I can use Colab and do actual ML stuff. Okay. Um, let's see. Thursdays are not going to work for me. Um, well, I'm flying on Thursday, but maybe we could meet on Wednesday this week. I'm happy to yep. do that. Okay. So let's plan on doing that. Sounds great. Good. Yeah. Excellent. All right, Rob. Great. All right. Well, thanks uh, very much. Yeah, no problem. All right. Yep. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Ciao for now.